Good evening and welcome. I am Susan Mizrucki, director of BU's Center for the Humanities. Andreas Hoysen, Kathy Carruth, Stephen Greenblatt, Judith Butler, Elaine Showalter, Slavo Zizek, Terry Eagleton, Hugh Kanner, Elaine Scarry. These are just a few of the distinguished humanities scholars who have delivered talks for BU's lectures and criticism series since its inception in 1983. It is an honor for the Center for the Humanities to be taking this illustrious event under its wing. This has allowed us to introduce two changes to the traditional series. The first is that instead of the annual four lectures, we will feature two, a fall lecture by a BU faculty member and a spring lecture by an external scholar. The second is that we will be drawing on BU faculty from all the humanities departments in contrast to the past where BU faculty participants were drawn exclusively from languages and literature departments. We are delighted to have Juliet Floyd as the very first professor of philosophy at BU to deliver a lecture in the series. Let me now call Walter Hopp of BU's Department of Philosophy to the podium who will introduce Juliet. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleague, Professor Juliet Floyd. Juliet Floyd has been at BU since 1995 after receiving her PhD from Harvard and teaching for some time at the City University of New York. In that time, she has established herself as an indefatigable university citizen, an outstanding teacher, and a world-renowned scholar. Her service to the department, the university, and the profession at large has been exemplary. She has consistently volunteered to serve on some of this institution's most demanding and important committees, including multiple search committees, the Provost Council for Faculty Development and Inclusion, and get this, an astonishing 14 years on the Appointment, Promotion, and Tenure Committee. Yes, that laugh is <laughs> indicated. Julia's professional service is equally impressive, including taking on key roles in the mentoring project for pre-tenure women, faculty, and philosophy, and the task force on women in philosophy. Juliet's teaching record is equally impressive. She's among the most sought after professors in the department and teaches a wide range of courses, including multiple courses in logic and the philosophy of mathematics, Wittgenstein, analytic philosophy, the philosophy of language, puzzles and paradoxes, and many others. Recently, Juliet won an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Sawyer Seminar Grant as a principal investigator on the theme of humanity and technology at the crossroads. She is presently co-teaching a course with Mrs. Professor Ms. Rookie on William Henry James and the New Media. Juliet has served on over 60 dissertation and master's thesis committees, as well as too many to count, really, undergraduate honors theses in independent studies. And finally, and of course not least, Juliet is a world-renowned and astonishingly productive scholar. She has published two monographs, edited or co-edited five volumes, and has published well over 100 journal articles book chapters, reviews, and encyclopedia entries. Her expertise is deep and wide-ranging. Juliet is widely recognized as one of the world's leading scholars on the history of analytic philosophy, and she has published extensively on Frege, Russell, Moore, Turing, Gödel, Quine, Foote, Cavell, Diamond, Putnam, and of course Wittgenstein, to name just a few. And of course I'm not mentioning Kant and the work he's done on Immanuel Kant. Recently she published a monograph with Cambridge University Press entitled Wittgenstein's Philosophy of Mathematics, which traces the development of Wittgenstein's conception of mathematics, the nature of mathematical proofs, and the goal of mathematical activity through his early, middle, and late periods, and which situates Wittgenstein's thought in relation to such figures as Russell, Poincaré, Hilbert, Gödel, and Turing, among others. And as you may gather from this description of the work, Juliet has also made significant contributions to the philosophy of logic, the philosophy of mathematics, and the philosophy of language the hard stuff that I won't touch. Maybe. Juliet has also done important recent work on new forms of media and the ways in which they, re they are rapidly changing the way in which humans receive, share, and interpret information. I could continue for a long time because I am pretty sure Juliet's CV is at least as long as the talk she is about to deliver. 
That talk, as you can see, is entitled Revisiting the Turing Test, Humans, Machines, and Phraseology. So I invite you all to welcome our speaker, Professor Juliet Floyd. Thank you so much, Walter. Thank you so much, Walter. I'm exhausted just hearing this and truly uh, honored by being the first philosopher to speak at the Lectures in Criticism. That's an incredible list of intellectuals. Uh, let's see if we can follow. <laughs> it's a tough, it's a tough, it's a tough act to follow. But I couldn't do what I do without my colleagues in the philosophy department, so thank you for being here tonight. Our department is very pluralistic. It's very wide ranging. People do the history of philosophy, contemporary philosophy. Walter is a prime example. Cutting across all kinds of traditions, which is the way I like to do philosophy. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to revisit something that I think has become part of popular culture. What I will do is say a few things about, can people hear me in the back? Can you hear me, Gabriel? Is that better if I'm closer? Uh, I will first say a bit, a word about Wittgenstein and Turing. Whoops. And then I will have to, we'll have to eat our vegetables. We'll have to say something about Turing's 1936 paper on computable numbers, where he analyzes the notion of a computation for the first time scientifically. Then we'll get to the Turing test, and then at the end I want to say a few words about what Turing went on to do 1939 to 1954 in thinking about the future of AI in our world. And it's really remarkable how philosophically prescient he was. It's absolutely amazing. And my main thesis will be that he really was a philosopher, not just a philosopher of mind, a philosopher all the way in almost every area. So. That'll be the, the main thing I'm going to try to do. The first thing to say is that we do live in Turing's world. When Turing was working at Bletchley Park, of course, there was the secret state. They couldn't talk about what they were doing. And uh, people didn't understand when he got the order of the British Empire why he had gotten it. It was because of the secret work at Bletchley Park. So what's happened over time is that Turing's if you liked it, the life of the secret state, which he had to live and which he suffered and died by, actually, that has made its way out increasingly into the public world. So when I say we live in Turing's world, I'm also very interested in the philosophy of popular culture. And it's amazing how Turing, of whom perhaps 25 years ago, no one you talked to or met on the street would have heard, now most people kind of know who, something about him. And that's because of this explosion in interest. And it's because each of us in our everyday lives has to deal with some of the problems he had to deal with. Problems of cryptography, problems of gender, problems of society, problems of the secret state. So this slide is a bit messy. On the top left, I wish I had a pointer, but I don't. On the top left is the biography of Turing, which I highly recommend, The Enigma by Andrew Hodges which did a lot in the 1980s to bring Turing into view. The gay rights movement was in full swing, and Hodges really brought Turing out of the closet, but he also is a mathematician, so he had a very broad sense of Turing's uh, scientific background. It's an excellent biography, and in fact was a model for a couple of other great biographies, Ray Monk's biography of Wittgenstein, and um, also, A Beautiful Mind, John Nash's biography. So it's, it's a stunning biography, which you certainly should look at if you, ever, if you like the genre of bi biography. If you don't, there are other genres. The playbill there is Breaking the Code. That's Jarek Jacoby, my personal fave uh, as a person playing Turing. It was a play. It hit Broadway. Then there's a wonderful film on that. Picture of the Enigma Machine, of course. Spy Catcher, we're dealing with Cambridge spies. The fifth spy was presumably Alistair Watson, who introduced Wittgenstein to Turing. So we have the secret things. Logic Comics, we have a gra graphic novel, which interestingly does not feature Turing that much, but it bases itself on Russell and Frege and Wittgenstein and the paradoxes. Uh, to the right of Logic Comics is <laughs> Lubner, Hugh Lubner, who was uh, a person who founded the Turing test as a public event. And this was run through about 19 about 2019, I think. Interestingly, social media was not included until the final year it was run. And Lubner himself was an activist on behalf of legalizing prostitution. I think he was very badly offended 
by the fact that Turing was persecuted as he was persecuted for having picked up a young man in a bar. The man robbed him, and Turing, being somewhat naive, reported it to the police, who then arrested Turing, convicted him on charges of gross indecency, the same charge Oscar Wilde was convicted on, forced him to choose between a year in prison and being injected with female hormones. He chose the latter. Basically, he was castrated. And he supposedly committed suicide about a year later in 1954. It's not clear it was suicide. I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but the uh, coroner's report is not absolutely clear. Robin Gandy, his student, was with him the weekend before and said Turing was fine. And all I have to say is that in the 1950s, it was a spectacularly bad time to be a homosexual who had state secrets and traveled regularly to Germany to discuss computers and physics with people. So we don't know. And we may find out more because more actually comes out uh, year by year from the archives. OK, so then we have films. Blade Runner, of course. There's Harrison Ford falling in love with a robot. Notice that in the first Blade Runner, lots of technology imagined, no social media whatsoever. Pre-mobile technology. And for me, mobile technology creates a huge change in everyday life in a computational world. There's Benedict Cumberbatch playing Turing. The atmosphere of that movie is very good, I think, the sort of secretive 1930s state of Bletchley Park. Ex Machina, one of my faves, because there's lots of Wittgenstein allusions in the film. The programming manual of the main character is called The Blue Book, and various portraits of Wittgenstein's sister by Klimt are on the wall. So there are a lot of quotations uh, alluding to what I'm going to talk about in a moment. George Dyson wrote a history of Oppenheimer and the bomb. The publishers, I think, got him to put Turing in the title. But the book isn't really about Turing. It's about sort of what Turing made possible. Uh, then we have the movie Enigma, which Mick Jagger produced. So that shows that you know we're really getting into cutting edge popular culture. You can see him on YouTube talking about it. Uh, her, he falls in love with his operating system. Then he finds out the operating system has been fallen in love with by lots of other people. So next to him is Watson winning Jeopardy in 2013. Here we move into the more social dimension as we go down the page because Watson won Jeopardy by scraping the web to check Wikipedia sites. It was all humanly generated content. So we really have the amalgamation of humans and machines, which is exactly what Turing had envisioned years before. Next to that is the letter from Queen Elizabeth pardoning Turing. The largest petition in the history of Britain was signed in the fall of 2008, demanding, using the web, using the Turing machine, that Turing be forgiven uh, and pardoned. So the Queen pardoned him. And then Turing's niece said that it would be illogical to pardon Turing for gross indecency and not pardon everyone else who was convicted. So Turing's law was passed, and approximately 40,000 convictions are still in the process, I think, of being overturned. So that's the use of the web, social activism. Um, then we have the novels of our time, which are the TV series. The Bletchley Circle, we begin to see the women behind the scenes, the African-American women behind the scenes, with the moonshot brought out into public scrutiny and drama. There's touring on the 50-pound note. I guess that's really making it. And uh, then we have Elon Musk, who is going to buy Twitter unless there are too many bots. And it's not clear what doing dil due diligence on that company is. So that's the Turing machine problem, the Turing test in action. And Hinge, of course, social media. So our students live a life that's very different from ours. It's mediated by these machines everywhere. So the basic picture I have here is that it's moving out into public culture. And the social dimensions, the social import of what Turing did becomes more and more obvious to the eye. So I think philosophers have to catch up with this, because philosophers who read Turing initially were obsessed with individual mind. And they were overlooking the reality of what Turing was doing. So my main claims here as a scholar of Turing and Wittgenstein is first, the imitation game in a 1950 paper from Mind. That was intended to be a social experiment in the evolution of human to human phraseology. That's Turing's word, by the way, in the presence of machines. 
It's a language game in Wittgenstein's sense, and Turing knew that it was. Turing second regarded intelligence as a response-dependent emotional and hence social concept like freedom or agency, and in his 1948 founding document of AI, his report to the National Physical Laboratory, he says so explicitly. So third, for Turing, it's human-to-human -human interaction in the presence of computational terminology, uh, technology that matters, not merely human-machine interaction. So that means I have to reject some widely accepted claims, and I'll just summarize. By the way, I forgot to say at the beginning, I have actually written this talk. The paper is done. I realized that the lectures and criticism ordinarily should be read. But I thought slides would be more fun and generate more discussion. So if you'd like a copy of the written version, I'm happy to send it to anyone. So I'm going to reject the following four claims. First, that the Turing test answers the question of whether an individual consciousness or sentience might be had by a machine. Google just fired someone who said that their natural language processor had sentience. Well, that's sort of interesting. Um, anyway, I don't think that's what the Turing test is about. Second, the Turing test's primary point often is said to be epistemological. Can machines fool humans by masquerading as human beings? That's an interesting question, indirectly suggested by Turing, but it's not really the heart of what the Turing test is. Third, I'm going to reject the idea that he was a computational mechanist or a functionalist about the human mind. My teacher, Hilary Putnam, used Turing's work to come up with functionalism. The last conversation I had with Hillary, I was arguing with him about this. No, Turing's not a mechanist. Fourth, Wittgenstein and Turing, here's an idea that I want to debunk, that Wittgenstein and Turing were mutually alien to one another philosophically on opposite sides of a philosophical dichotomy between methods of ordinary language and methods of formal logic. And here I have in mind Ray Monk, whose biography I adore. I just recommended it to you. But I think Ray misreads the relationship between Wittgenstein and Turing. So my argument in general terms is that Wittgenstein and Turing say, shared a matrix of foundational philosophical ideas about the nature of logic. They also, in fact, discussed the nature, limits, and foundations of logic over many years. They drew from one another in their work, as they both recognized. And we have here, therefore, a philosophical confluence of ideas forged over many years. So it's not this image of Wittgenstein is the humanities and Turing is the computer scientist mechanist, and we have a clash. It's much more subtle than that. So in juxtaposing these two figures, I'm also sort of making a claim that philosophy becomes more and more important in the computational world, more and more important. And Turing certainly saw that this would be so. So in the direction from Wittgenstein to Turing, I want to say that Turing focused always on taking what we say and do with words seriously on the limits of formal methods, not only their power. And secondly, everyday language, including our typings or categories of objects, as they occur naturally in science and everyday life, are an evolving framework or technology. And Turing stressed everyday human conversation and phraseology as foundational the social and cultural dimensions of computations and algorithms. The word phraseology he took from Russell, by the way, and it's in the blue book in Wittgenstein as well. So when he uses it, he's quite self-conscious about that Cambridge tradition. Just a little history on this slide. Uh, Turing came to Cambridge uh, in 1931. He was born in 1912, so he was very young. And things were happening at Cambridge around him. He was a math student, and the math students got together every afternoon and talked. And so my circumstantial argument is it's impossible that Turing would not have either seen Wittgenstein's blue book or talked with people who were being dictated to by Wittgenstein. So in March of 1933, at the age of 21, Turing read Russell's Introduction to Mathematical Philosophy. This is the same book that got Gödel, Stephen Kleene, many, many of the most famous logicians into logic. And he encounters in it the notion of philosophical phraseology and Wittgenstein's idea that logic is tautological. And he began studying logic very seriously. He stayed up all night with a friend, couldn't stop talking. In the fall of 33, 
Wittgenstein had taught philosophy of math in the spring of 32 as well. I don't know whether Turing was there. I have no evidence one way or the other. But in the fall of 33, there was sort of a public brouhaha at Cambridge because Braithwaite published something in the undergraduate Cambridge Journal complaining that Wittgenstein had not been publishing. So for you junior faculty members, <laughs> just remember, people complain about you're not publishing enough. I mean, don't listen all the time already. <laughs> so Wittgenstein was very upset by this. And when he went to teach his course, Philosophy for Mathematicians, in the fall, a huge number of people showed up, about 45 students. And they started peppering him as smart Cambridge undergraduates with all kinds of questions. Well, Mr. Wittgenstein, you know, what do you make of this? Wittgenstein was horrified. And so he, um, he canceled the class. And what he said he would do was to dictate to three or four students, four or five maybe, of the math students. So that's what the blue and the brown book are. They're dictations to math students. And that's why I think it's impossible that Turing wouldn't have known or had access to them. The books were named for the co color of the covers in which they were wrapped, and they were quickly passed around like Zomstadt. It's interesting that by December of 33, Turing spoke to the Moral Sciences Club. We don't have a copy of the lecture, but we have the notes of the lecture. And what he argued is that the purely logistic view of mathematics is inadequate, because there are many different ways to interpret mathematics. So you see a kind of pluralism already about language emerging in that very, very young lecture. Now jumping ahead to our vegetables, in 1936, Turing gives the fundamentally persuasive analysis of computation by inventing the idea of what was soon called by church a Turing machine. And what that shows is that the human interface, the human context of a shareable command is demonstrated to be fundamental to the nature of computation. And the question is, how did he do it? This is a big question in the history of science. 1936, he's very young. He's 24, 25 years old. How did he do this so quickly? Because his model is very new. It's not like what was in the literature at all. I have an answer for that. It's a somewhat speculative answer, but I'm the only one who has an answer for that. So this is my answer, is that he had read the blue book. In the blue and the brown books, First of all, Wittgenstein makes a sort of anthropological move. You're trying to get at, in the context uh, in which you have jungles of formal systems now, sprouting around and being studied by mathematicians. Some are systems of equations. Some are formalized metamathematics. Some are the lambda calculus. Things are all over the place. So it's like a jungle. As Emile Post would say, it was alien and forbidding all these formalisms. What Wittgenstein was trying to do was to cut down to the basic philosophical point of a formalism in general and achieve some kind of understandable elucidation or intelligible account of what a formalism in general is. Now, you can't do that by just writing down another formalism. It won't work. You have to do something philosophical. So this is what he was trying to do. So first he comes up with the notion of a language game. There are many different interpretations of what that means. For me, a language game is just a snapshot of a portion of human language use, used for a certain purpose to elucidate philosophically. And what he was trying to elucidate, of course, was Hilbert's idea of humans operating with signs and thinking with signs in a step-by-step -step calculational way. And Wittgenstein comes up with the idea, sorry, of uh, treating this idea in terms of command tables, rules in terms of tables. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Uh, that's like a Turing machine. And he also raises a question about general training. This is around page 40 in the Brown book. And later, after he'd read Turing's paper, Wittgenstein came back to this and kept calling it the problem, the problem, the problem. Why is it a problem? As you'll see in a moment, it's a problem because that whole idea of a general idea of teaching a human being in general to calculate is too complicated to be captured by that model. Wittgenstein also says at the opening of the Blue Book, can a machine think is a grammatical question requiring careful investigation, not a survey exactly, not the bad ordinary language philosophy, which Turing also rejected, but an investigation. It's not yet clear. We can, for example, say that there is thinking in the hand, 
But this doesn't refute the idea of human consciousness as irreducible. Human beings act both mechanically, they are used as machines. These are little allusions to Marx, but Wittgenstein, of course, never says so. Humans can be used as machines, but human beings also act creatively. So an investigation, and an investigation always takes place for Wittgenstein when we don't quite know what to say. An investigation of the concept of thinking must attend to how concepts are used in everyday life. Grammatical experiments with specific, sometimes invented phraseologies, that is the comparison of different snapshots of human language use and their amalgamation and then carefully looking at what we're inclined to say about it, that's the method. So his greatest paper, I say, turns on the method of language use. There's a picture from section 41 of the Brown book. You have a command table. A rule is expressed in terms of, a routine is expressed in terms of a table. You have four simple symbols. You have four simple steps. You can put together strings of commands. And then you can watch and see what a string or command results in. So that's the basic picture. And in my imagination, but it may not just be in my imagination, Turing saw that. And he sees now there could be a way to conceive the problems of the foundations of mathematics at this time in terms of this simple model. It's a remarkable stretch. I don't think Gödel, Quainy, no one from the mathematics schools in Göttingen would have come up with this. They were mathematicians. They were using equations, the lambda calculus. They would never have thought of this. Only, I think, because of this Cambridge tradition, Turing, and because of Turing's own sense of the importance of simplicity, the importance of everyday life, and doing what you can do with the least possible labor. That's what he really was up to. So the heart of our vegetables is this. Hilbert's Entscheidung's problem, it means the decision problem, uh, asked, is there a definite method, what we would call an algorithm, for deciding yes or no, whether or not a sentence of a theory couched in a formal system of logic follows from the axioms? And G.H. Hardy put it this way in his writings, do mathematicians make discoveries by turning the handles of a miraculous machine? Because that would have been the case if there were such an algorithm. Turing's answer to Hilbert is no. There does not exist and there cannot exist a general algorithm, no definite method in Hilbert's sense, to decide. Thinking is not in general reducible to algorithms. So it's a negative result. More generally, there's no general algorithm to determine in advance what an algorithm will do on a particular input. The idea of working out the consequences of a concept or a set of equations cannot in general be foreseen. And Stephen Wolfram, who created Mathematica and lives locally, actually, he's very interested in Turing and calls this computational irreducibility. It's a very big revolution in the history of science because now very simple rules that could be written down before the 20th century Scientists would have thought, well, OK, you have a set of equations. You put inputs in, and you can predict. Now, even very simple rules. You have to actually run the thing in order to see what it's going to do. That's a fundamental irreducibility. And finally, in his last paper of 1954, Turing shows there will always be a need for humans to use what he calls common sense as a result. So a basic point I'm going to make before we get to the Turing test is this. It's a logical point. To obtain a positive result that there is a machine or an algorithm or a definite method to do something, you just produce the machine or the algorithm. But if you're going to say that there can't be an algorithm to do that, you actually have to do something. You have to give a characterization of what it would have been in general to do it. Otherwise, you can't get an impossibility result. So this is a fundamental difference between positive results and negative results. The negative results require a firm grasp of the concept that's being shown to be impossible relative to some other. As I've said, to say what a formal system of logic is, we can't just write down another formal system. You have to get at it. You have to clarify it, what it is. And the answer of Turing and Wittgenstein is logic or a system of logic is used by human beings who speak, act, calculate, and converse in an embodied social world. And words are constantly being embedded and re-embedded 
in what Wittgenstein calls only after reading Turing's paper, forms of life. Here's from Wilfred Zieg, who's an expert at CMU on <clears throat> the history of the Hilbert School. Most importantly, in the given intellectual context, the move from arithmetically motivated calculation to general symbolic processes that underlie them has to be carried out programmatically by human beings. The Entscheidungs problem had to be solved by us in a mechanical way. It was the normative demand of radical intersubjectivity between humans that motivated the step from axiomatic to formal systems. And I would add a corollary and the next step from formal systems to their uses by embodied human beings. But the radical demand for radical intersubjectivity is now a nightmare, as we see in our world. We're on mobile phones all the time, constantly checking, as animals do, to see where we are socially. And therefore, um, this demand of radical intersubjectivity has become almost a crushing load. So I think Wilfred says it very well. It's a very rigorous idea about the Hilbert program. Here's Wittgenstein in 1947. Seems to me he's reproducing the argument of Turing's 1936 paper by memory here. He might have had it open in front of him, but it looks like maybe he was doing it from memory, which shows it had an impact. Turing's machines, these are humans who calculate. And you might express what he says also in the form of games, and the interesting ones would be such as brought one by certain rules to nonsensical constructions. One has received the order go on in the same way when this makes no sense, say because one has got onto a circle, for that order makes sense only in certain positions. And then Wittgenstein goes on to reproduce Turing's proof from the 36th paper in his own language. And Wittgenstein knows that Turing's proof that shows you can't have a single machine to decide the behavior of all the other machines is a machine that runs into a tautological circle. The machine, you try to enumerate all the machines, and it gets to its own commands, and it's told to do what you do. Do what you do is OK if I'm in an embodied world where I'm teaching you to ride a bike. I could say, do what you do. But if we're in the context of a logical system in the Hilbert program, do what you do is empty. You can't do anything with it. It's not a rule that you can follow. Okay, so in that way, Wittgenstein is seeing that that's what Turing shows is fundamental to our notion of logic. The stored program computer concept, I'm almost to the Turing test, although it's five past six, so I better hurry. Um, Turing constructs the universal machines that does the work of all machines. A Turing machine, from one point of view, is just a series of commands. So you could list them all in alphabetical order. And then you could put them all together, and there could be just one big machine that does the work of all. That's the universal machine. And that gives us the stored program computer concept. Um, it can operate on its own command. So when it gets to its own number, it can follow various rules that are for itself. Now, one can't diagonalize out. This is a sort of logical point of the defined class of computable functions. The universal machine gives us a robust, Gödel would say, absolute parameter for what counts as a step in a computation. It's independent of what language or theory you're in. That's remarkable. You don't have that for notions like definability or provability. Those are relative to a language. The notion of computability is not, not in the same way. And Turing's universal machine is responsible, I think, ultimately, for the ubiquity of computational processing in our world and its indefinite extent and ability to compress what is definable. It just goes on and on. You just keep adding on more and more algorithms. And you can keep amalgamating them because you have a robust parameter. It doesn't change when you add one to the next. In some sense, there's one absolute system. And finally, the universal machine implies, and here I'm following Martin Davis, that there are no ultimate general dichotomies between hardware data and software, which we know, because the hardware can work on the software, and the software can be told to work on the hardware, and this can be input from the outside. So what computer scientists of the 50s used to take dogmatically as this nice, clean cut doesn't now hold. OK, so Turing and nonsense. Here he is lecturing to the mathematicians in 1947. And he had a very good sense of humor. 
The masters, that is, he means the mathematicians, so he's speaking to the London Mathematical Society, are liable to get replaced because as soon as any technique becomes at all stereotyped, it becomes possible to devise a system of instruction tables which will enable the electronic computer to do it for itself. It may happen, however, that the masters will refuse to do this. They may be unwilling to let their jobs be stolen from them in this way. In that case, they would surround the whole of their work with mystery and make excuses couched in well-chosen gibberish whenever any dangerous suggestions were made. I think that a reaction of this kind is a very real danger. And I actually think so, too. I actually think that nonsense is one of the biggest problems that we face. It's a growth field. So, Cambridge Analytica scandal, Facebook stock fell by 15%. It's very fragile technology. If we all unplug from Facebook tomorrow, Zuckerberg's dead. Think about it. Okay. So now I'm just going to tell you that it's hard to picture what a Turing machine is, despite the fact that it's a perfectly definite mathematical object. This, of course, is the duck rabbit in the Göttingen uh, playground, right near Hilbert's grave. So it happens to be my favorite duck rabbit ever. Um, but you could see what a Turing machine is in many different ways. This is a picture of the universal machine being defined in the 1936 paper. So you see it's just tables with variables. You have to have variables and collect them all together. Here's Wittgenstein's picture. They're humans who calculate with pencils. And Turing begins his paper by saying we may compare, this is the method of language games, a man in the process of computing a real number to a machine which is only capable of a finite number of conditions. This is from a very well-known textbook. It doesn't reproduce very well here. Can people see there's like a little man inside? It's very bad because he's kind of a slave. He's sort of like, you've got the picture that he's, not, he's reckoning according to a rule, so he can't create, do anything creative, so he's stuck in the box. That's sort of the picture. But it's kind of awful. And here we have another picture, but now the human being has disappeared, and it's just a machine, and we have to ask who sees the tape. And what is this thing going to do if we release it in the wild? Here's from Wolfram's book. The top is an image of a shell. The bottom is an image of a graph produced by Wolfram, who wrote down some equations and watched and saw what they computed. So the suggestion is that nature itself computes. And some physicists think all there is to physics is what computes. But it's not so easy to predict how it's going to be. Turing himself worked on beautiful things like uh, the morphology of plants. Why does a flower have, obey the Fibonacci series as it unfolds symmetrically? So there's no humans at all involved in this. This is just nature as such. This is my favorite machine, uh, Turing machine picture, because this is Blythe House in London when it was being used as a post office in the 1930s. Now, the term computer referred generally to women up until the late 1940s, because the women would be employed as clerks in some systematic operation like this, and they would have to just use calculations all day. And in his paper, Turing makes it very clear. He says, I'm going to replace the notion of a state of mind, an inner state of mind, with a note. And it's very important that if someone needs to take a break, they can take this note and hand it off to their co-worker, and the co-worker can come and continue the computation. That's internal to the grammar of computation. It has to be impersonal. And everyone has to be fungible, dispensable. Otherwise, the system doesn't compute. So I think this is interesting. Now, of course, we don't call our mobile phones computers. We don't do that even though they are computers. First, we didn't like calling women computers, so we didn't like women and machine chips being together, so we, we stopped calling women computers. Then we call things made of wire and plastic computers. But we don't do that with our mobile phone, because the mobile phone is like an extension of your hand. It's a prosthetic device handling your whole social environment. So we don't want to say that it computes. There we are at Bletchley. They called the women wrens, like birds. This could be a Turing machine, too. And now whose computing is us? 
And as you make choices with your cell phone, they are building an avatar of you at the company, and it will know all the choices you've ever made, and it will be able to suggest to you future choices, of course, choices from a small menu of things. And so more and more, we turn over to AI and to these machines decisions. And then we have the whole theory of nudging, that it's a good thing, social policy can nudge people. But the problem with the paradigm is that they regard anything that's not algorithmic as what is called noise. And there's a book by the title of Noise that's just come out. Turing is pro-noise, and he doesn't think it's just noise. He thinks it's meaningful, human conversation. It's the driving force. So Turing and Wittgenstein were in conversation. I'm going to go over a little. I hope that's OK in all here. I haven't even gotten to the Turing test yet, so forget this history. OK, here we are. So here we are. The Computing Machinery and Intelligence. So here's the paper. He published the paper in mind, and he used to read portions of it out to Robin Gandy, his student, and they would giggle. Norman Malcolm read the paper and wrote to Wittgenstein and said, is this a joke? And Wittgenstein said, I know this person. I don't think it's a lead pole. OK, but Turing was playful. He wanted to tweak the philosophers at their own game. And so he does. So the first thing in the imitation game is that gender is the control. So here in this game, human C is behind a screen and communicating remotely with a person. These are all men, of course, but Turing given his gender troubles, is playing with this. You have to decide which is the man and which is the machine. And if you can uh, figure out which is male and which is female, you're OK. But then the Turing test is to explore our notion of thinking. How far can the notion of thinking stretch? And I call this the Cartesian Turing test because it's the usual way it's set up. C is a human being behind the screen. B is another human being. These are all men in the picture. A is a terminal, a computer. And the idea is to figure out which is which. Now, I call it the Cartesian test because what people forget, what philosophers forget is, after the test is run, C is going to come out from behind the screen and go ask B if B would like to have a cup of coffee. That's what's going to happen. And B, depending on what C said about B, may or may not want to have a cup of coffee. So it's a social test. And Turing knew that. It's repeatable. And in fact, in our world, this is the way to think about it. It's going on all the time. We're watching other people. Some people are going to prefer sex robots. Some people probably do. What do you think? There's a lot of different things you could think. There are an increasing number of forms of life. So human conversation is what really holds up the use of our concepts in some everyday sense. But the Turing test is going all the time because we mediate so many of our actions through these machines. I'll just quote Wittgenstein, what is called winning in chess might be losing in another game. So you could win at the Turing test, but um, that might be losing in another game. And what are we to say now? It's not so clear what we're supposed to say. So what he's not doing with the Turing test is the following, trying to prove that machines can think. Remember I told you about negative results. All of the objections he considers are people who try to show that machines cannot think. All Turing is doing is showing that they don't have a clear notion of thinking. They don't have a clear enough notion of intelligence to say it's impossible. That's really what he's doing. He's a logician. So he's not trying himself to prove that machines can think. He's not assuming that behaviorism is true. He's not trying to prove that machines are conscious and capable of emotion. He's not trying either to explain, elucidate, or deny the fact of consciousness. He's not trying to prove that humans are machines. He's not trying to prove that machines are indistinguishable from humans. He is not merely stipulating an operational or behavioristic notion of intelligence. And he is not assuming that disinterpreted operation is signs are capable of grounding meaning. And all of those things are typically said of Turing by philosophers of mind. And it just simply isn't the case. What he is doing is showing that one cannot prove a negative result, that machines cannot think, because as yet one does not have a clear enough concept of thought. 
He's also showing us how we might explore together the emotional effects of computational machinery on our ways of expressing ourselves and relating to one another. And finally, he's framing a repeatable, social, philosophically minded human to human experiment in phraseology or ordinary language. It's supposed to take place in life. And that's what philosophers have so far not really appreciated about jewelry. Now, uh, I, I, we're not going to go through all of the arguments. The one he takes most serious is Lady Lovelace's objection, number six here, that machines are not creative or surprising. And Turing says, no, I'm often surprised by the machines I work with. And he really was. He was working with the very first stored program computer. And he notes computational irreducibility. He says, Lady Lovelace, she was very brilliant, of course. She probably wrote down the first program for a machine, for Babbage's analytical engine. But she didn't understand the negative results about logical consequence. Um, finally, number nine is the argument from extrasensory perception. And people are often confused. Why does he, what if the person behind the screen just intuits somehow the thoughts of another person? And Turing takes that very seriously, actually. I mean, it's not his job to prove that there is no ESP. And he's right that if there were, then the Turing test would run into problems. But it is sort of interesting that Wittgenstein says in the investigations, there are no real techniques for firmly establishing the authenticity of a human being's expression of emotion. And so Turing is leaving room for the idea that maybe there could be expertise in this domain that outstrips what science can offer. OK, there's Searle's Chinese room. You know what I'm going to say about that, which is that Searle, who says that he's operating this simple book with these Chinese people, Searle needs to come out of the room and start to talk with the people outside the room. That's what Searle needs to do. So Searle can believe that consciousness is biologically embodied in brains. That's fine, but that doesn't touch the Turing test. Turing's not taking a stand on that. OK, now finally, I'm going to skip this because I've run out of time. Um, Turing writes a piece on the reform of mathematical notation where he brings in the issue of phraseology and explicitly says uh, he gets this from Wittgenstein's lectures. Symbolic logic is a very alarming mouthful for most mathematicians. Logicians are not very much interested in making it more palatable. It seems, however, that symbolic logic has a number of small lessons for the mathematician, which may be taught without it necessary for him to learn very much symbolic logic. In particular, it seems that symbolic logic will help the mathematicians improve their notation and phraseology. And then he goes on to say, it would not be advisable, he suggests a reform of mathematical notation in light of everyday language in the paper. And he says it wouldn't be advisable to let the reform of notation take the form of a cast iron logical system into which all the mathematics of the future are to be expressed. No democratic mathematical community would stand for such an idea, nor would it be desirable. So I'm now just going to end with a couple more slides from the 1948 address to the Phys National Physical Laboratory. This is the founding document of AI. Turing says there he's going to make a conjecture that Actually, intelligence consists in appreciating the differences between different kinds of searching. That's a wonderful idea. If you got one idea out of reading later Wittgenstein, it should be that idea. There's differences in different ways of looking for things. So he comes up with three examples. The first is the intellectual search. We might arrange to take all possible arrangements of choices in order and go on until the machine proved a theorem which by its form could be verified to give a solution of the problem. Further research into intelligence and machinery will probably be very gratefully concerned with searches of this kind. We may call such searches intellectual searches. So obviously, we look for algorithms. We look for R. We look for ways of handling large data sets. That's a big part of what goes on today. It may be of interest to mention two other kinds of search in this connection. There is the genetical or evolutionary search by which a combination of genes is looked for. He knew about Watson and Crick. He foresaw computational biology. It's obvious if you think about it. The criterion being survival value. The remarkable success of this search confirms to some extent the idea that intellectual activity consists mainly of various kinds of search. 
But I want to close with this one because this is a Humanities <coughs> Foundation lecture. The one that he ends with, the one that he thinks is most important, is what he calls the cultural search. The remaining form of search is what I should like to call the cultural search. The isolated man does not develop any intellectual power. It's necessary for him to be immersed in an environment of other men whose techniques he absorbs during the first 20 years of his life. He may then perhaps do a little research on his own and make a very few discoveries which are passed on to others. From this point of view, the search for new techniques must be regarded as carried out by the human community as a whole rather than by individuals. And I would like to say that in, in a, a time of data culture, which is really what this is, popular culture is very important. It's very globalized. So many problems we face with mobile technology especially are both local problems and also global problems. We see airports around the world that are beginning to look kind of the same. So the flattening of all of this is something Turing foresaw. And for him, our phraseology and our conversations about it are going to be the driving force for the future. So I do like to think of him as a philosopher and as someone in the humanities. So I'll just stop with that. So Professor Floyd would be happy to take questions. Yes. Um, and I have a mic here that I can hand over to you. You want to raise one? I'm looking at the philosophers. <laughs> okay. Mr. Paolo. Thank you for the talk. Um, I just wanted to ask something about a very specific point about surprise. Yeah. And uh, Turing's stance on that. So I'm thinking, obviously, of the, um, of the Tractatus um, comment on there are no surprises in logic. In logic, there are no surprises. In logic, there are no surprises. That turned out to be wrong. Well, yeah, I, that, that, yeah, I, I read that in the paper. So that's s somewhat what I wanted to 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 um, ask you to say more about. Um, so I'm I'm reading the tractatus in a way in which uh, Wittgenstein is already thinking of something like logic and mathematics as a social practice, or at least mm -hmm. you know, as logic and mathematics or proposition of logic and mathematics has been defined by the nexus of use right. and features such as surprise, which are emotional features as being relevant to the subjects themselves. And, um, and I think when he's saying that there are no surprises in logic, he's getting at a point that is very familiar to many practicing mathematicians or you know, computer sciences or something, which is, I mean, it's hard to put it shortly, but something about there being an aim in trying to survey or to understand the proof, the end of which is somewhat, I find it tautological or trivial or coming just getting used to it to the point that it right. cannot bring any more surprises. So, right. so in that sense, I don't see that comment as necessarily wrong. And I was just one, my question for you is whether you think this was a point of tension between Wittgenstein and Turing even um, in the later work or, yeah. No, I guess I'm seeing them as coming together around how to make sense of both of these things. So, for example, a proof, if it's formalized, in a logical system, step by step. There are no gaps. A it's machine implementable. So in that sense, there are no surprises. <laughs> I mean, but the humans watching the machine could be very surprised, right? So one of the problems is things really change when you move from 2 plus 2 equals 4, where there are very few surprises. I mean, if I had to, <laughs> if I had to check over 2 plus 2 equals 4 10 times, I wouldn't really be calculating. It involves termination very quickly. But with these proof makers, these mechanized proof engines that we have now, you can't really see your way through. There's no way that you really would take the time to bother to see what all the steps are. You have to trust the program. And so as you know, there are some very famous math problems that are solved now, partly by computer, partly by pure thinking, the pure thinking part is published in the math journal and all of the computer stuff, I'm thinking of Tom Hales and the Kepler conjecture. The Kepler conjecture wants to know what's the most efficient way to pack oranges in a crate. Turns out it's a pyramid. But to prove that is really difficult. 
So a lot of his proof turned out to be just in a computer science journal. And now does it sort of lack that necessity? Maybe so, maybe not. But in the human world, it's not so clear in mathematics what's going to happen. And mathematicians themselves are divided over this. Some people think formal proof methods are great. And you know what will happen is, ultimately, mathematicians will be working down there at the National Security Archives or something. And then once a year, they'll come out and they'll deliver the message, hey, you know, here are the most interesting theorems of the year. And no one will have any idea how they were proved. Is it going to be like that, or is mathematics still going to be a matter of human beings trading ideas and working things out? So I think these are very living questions. And I think they're completely compatible with later Wittgenstein. The problem Wittgenstein had with what he said in the Tractatus later on is the Tractatus made it sound like he had the full philosophical point of view basically in place, the nature of logic. He sort of thought he saw it sort of has to be this way. And he realized, no, that's not really seeing anything clearly at all. So I think they're together on this, but the point is that the necessities of mathematics ride on the back of a lot of contingencies, some of them in the social world, and some of them having to do with everyday language. And if you take those away, it's not really clear that you have calculation anymore or computation. That's why the notion of information is, I think, overused, because we use language for a lot of different things, not only to trade information. And that's a prejudice of the tradition, to look at it that way. We do a lot of things with language. We date people. We meet people. We ghost people. We do a lot of things. So Turing's very, very well aware of that. Thank you. So is Wittgenstein. Thank you very much, Juliet. That was a wonderful talk. Learned a lot in a short amount of time. Um, I wondered about if you could, this is a flat-footed question, but maybe those are the best. Uh, there's this, there was a slide a, a couple of times about not knowing what thought is. Mm. And I wondered if you could just speak generally. I mean, I know this might sound, become too abstract or too general, but What's the relationship between thinking and computing? That's a big problem nowadays. I think you're a Heidegger scholar, so this is right up your alley. It's very hard. We use the phrase artificial intelligence. It's sort of an everyday thing. I don't know whether we should or not. The AIs don't think the way we, we do. But rather than thinking of the AIs as sort of taking over the world in some Terminator nightmare, the real problem is human beings are saving labor by devolving decisions onto these machines. And maybe that's good because maybe when you want to do something on Netflix, you know, it will curate the genomic number of films for you and, and that will help. So data culture may involve some interaction between AIs and humans. But the real problem is if the humans stop making decisions because it's easier and simpler just to leave it to the AI. So for example, when you're typing email now, at least my program, it autofills language. <laughs> Charles, you're in linguistics. It's all your fault. No, the autofill is getting better and better. I hate it. I like to think I'm thinking out what I'm going to say. And I'm bothered by those suggestions. But now, you know, we have maybe AIs can grade a certain number of college essays. and maybe for certain kinds of essays, not if it were written by humans, by the way. For certain kinds of college essays, they're as good as humans. And how is that going to change how people write college essays? That's the question I have. So it's us. It does have to do with agency. Responsibility. It does have to do with embedding words and forms of life. The people I work with. There's always drift between your words and what is the thing. That ongoing friction to use with each time is part of meaning. And if we just let things slide, I think things. But I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, empathy measures among children are way down. That's the relative uh, age five. Because the kids are on iPads. 
You know, learning how to have a face-to-face -face conversation is very difficult, especially about stuff where we really differ from one another. So these are the things we have to worry about. What's thinking? You know, are we just going to let the AIs figure out, you know, how to deal with problems? I don't know. I don't know the answer. But this is exactly what Julian was worried about. Just exactly. Um, and I don't think that consciousness one way or the other is going to be the mark. For him, it's what you do. Your activity and your sense of responsibility. So in reading him, ultimately, as an ordinary language philosopher, that's what makes him but thank you for that. I, I wish I had a clear answer to that, but I don't think there's going to be one. All right, Samia, you had your hand up. Oh, oh Walter, what? that's fine. Are you sure? Well, no, that's fine. Well, so thank you very much, Julia. The, this talk actually made sense of something I've always found a little bit puzzling in Turing's work, and that is two years before or so, I think around 1948, he gives a definition of computation in terms of a human being with a pencil and paper obeying rules rigorously and he adds without thinking or without thought. Mm -hmm. So he actually defines computing in terms of somebody doing something thoughtlessly. In an and then oddly sense. enough, in, in an, an everyday, everyday sense. sense. And then two years later it comes out with a paper which, as you know, the common reading is he's trying to argue that machines could at least in principle think. Right. And your interpretation so. really makes sense of how those two points could be compatible with one yeah. another. I had one further question which is, do you think it would be, and this is very closely related to Dan's, but we could just put it in a simple question, which is not, doesn't have a simple answer, I think. Is it quite possible, given your interpretation of Turing, that the best chess player on Earth right now is a human being? Well, I mean, it depends what thinking is. We have yes. to default to <laughs> Dan's question. I mean, it has changed the game of chess. Yes. So young chess players, as I understand it, they work on openings. They're really good at openings because the computers can show them lots of different things. Of course, there's a scandal now with Carlson and cheating. Yeah, and that's a different one. I don't know Using an AI. What, I don't know the back story on that. I mean, I guess maybe the guy cheated and Carlson shouldn't have called him out on it quite in that way. I'm not quite sure. Notice, it's the human drama that still interests us. Even if we can build a machine, it's going to beat any human. So, you know, this is the sort of trivial point. You know, cars move a lot faster than humans can run. But we still have the Olympics. We still have running matches. It's our forms of life. So what happens is it's important to figure out what matters. That's not a trivial thing. And I think in our world, especially for young people in this room, it's incredibly important. There's, you could be different genders, ideas, labels. This generation is very serious about embedding words in forms of life. And there's going to be a whole lot of them. And they're going to be even more. And now with reproductive technology being the way it is. So these are, to me, very revolutionary and fundamental problems. That's why it's philosophy. And I don't know that Turing had a sharp answer for what thinking is. He's sort of a pragmatist. I mean, I would read that last slide sounding a little bit like Peirce, maybe. You know, this pragmatist idea that there's an evolution of human signs and human concepts over time. C.I. Lewis always taught Darwin in his epistemology classes. So maybe something like that, but. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the things I think is like, talk about topic as a leader, like, because he's concerned about conflict. Is that a little bit vague? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and it's not clear that it's chatting. I'm not sure what Siri's do, but I'm not sure I would say it's chatting. But that doesn't mean that my thinking might not be deeply affected by Siri, my own thinking, what I think about, what I think is important. So that's where it all comes in. And I think there's a lot of talk of ethics in AI, responsible AI. But, you know, this is not going to be a really easy we do utilitarianism. I mean, it's not going to be a meta-ethical thing to get to. The problem is we can't let the engineers release these algorithms into the world and hurt the most vulnerable populations. And it's really hard to see in advance what to do. So it's very powerful and very fundamental. As fundamental as consciousness, I would say, but maybe you'd disagree. Samia.
Thanks, Juliet. That was fascinating. Um, I was struck by the coffee um, point in the imitation game and was wondering if you think that there's anything, I mean, do you have more thoughts on like what's going on with that or is it just a throwaway <laughs> no, it's not a throwaway. point in the paper? No, yeah. I'm very serious. Yeah, no, me too. Yeah, no, it's a social exercise in phraseology. And the problem with philosophers of mind who thought Turing was a mechanist or a behaviorist is they thought that it was just a one-shot deal. They weren't seeing it as a language game, which means you have to take it to the next step. Now what happens when someone told a joke and it didn't go over very well? Actually, with the, with the Leubner Turing test, it turned out that humans who were trying to figure out which was human and which was machine, they didn't want to be wrong, right? So they tended to misclassify humans as machines much more frequently than machines <laughs> as humans. And I think there was a woman who was a Shakespeare scholar, as a matter of fact, who was wonderful. And the contestants all thought that she was a machine because they couldn't believe that a human being could know that much Shakespeare. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing I have in mind. You know, it's to tell us about our, re it's relational. It's about our relations to one another. And Turing really thinks that's what it's all about. And I think that's what it's about. And I think that's why mobile technology is the big one. There are more mobile phones than there are humans on the planet right now. It's an ecological disaster on top of everything. But we can't be without them. The cost of opting out of that is enormous. So we really have a lot of problems that are both global and local. I mean, the penetration of cell phones in uh, underdeveloped countries is much higher because people don't have the infrastructure. And now we have maybe a billion people with voice-activated technology. A billion people will come online who are not literate. So they need their say, too. And when Turing talks about democracy, he's not just kidding. I mean, you could think of democracy as one political system, among others, but you could also think of it as a way to allow the maximal number of voices to be heard. And that's how Turing's thinking about it. And you know, he said at one point, the Americans like to throw hardware at problems. <laughs> I throw software at problems. And he did. And he wrote the very first programming manual ever written in 1950 for the Manchester baby, and this is for the English department, Lytton Strachey's nephew was the person who programmed it to be the first computer-generated music. God Save the Queen played over the BBC, 1950. So just think about world music, too. And Turing was heavily involved in the very first generation of music. So that wasn't just a throwaway. I'm trying to get from very theoretical stuff and historical stuff, which fascinates me, to the present world. But I think for me, the line back is read Turing as really sophisticated philosophically, because he is. He's not some naive computer scientist just doing a public relations event. Nor was John Searle right to make the Turing test solely about individual consciousness in relation to symbols of signs. I mean, Searle is inside this Chinese room, but like someone had to teach him to read symbols from a book and not do something creative. That takes a lot of work, a lot of work. The amount of effort that has been invested in every person in this room to get you to be able to reckon unthinkingly, it's enormous, it is enormous. Okay, so thank I, you, no, not a throwaway. Sorry, I'm always interrupting, Juliet. That's okay. <laughs> Um, we, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, wow, maybe we, we should open up a little more, but well, since you're next, close by. I thank you all for staying till quarter of seven. This is shocking. Thanks. Well, the, uh, just I'll be quick. The, the Chinese room uh, was, of course, about translation. Um, did Turing have things to say about machine translation? No. Well, the effort was really at the kind of thing that Wolf had said. So in the form of Wittgenstein's lectures. What he wants is to develop intermediate levels of language that will be more perspicuous, or Paolo, this is related to your question, maybe more intelligible for human beings, but not necessarily be natural languages. So the test is going to be, is it useful for whatever it is that your problem is that's at hand? But also, it's to save human labor. So I think translation is fascinating because of Google Translate. I think 
the whole practice in the humanities of translation, which is so important. I mean, I'm so opinionated about how to translate Wittgenstein, it's not even funny. <laughs> I, I mean, I yell at Peter Hacker in my lectures with my students. So, um, you know, this is another example of the chess question. What are we gonna do with this? So for business purposes, maybe it's no problem. Or for me, my Norwegian isn't very good, so it would help me. But for real translation, for really getting inside another culture, there's no substitute for that. Humans have to learn it. So that's the social part. So it's the interaction of the two. But translation is fascinating. Yeah, I love it that this person was kicked out of Siegel for saying that the natural language process are like sentience. You know, the ecological disaster of these things, these natural language processing systems, I mean, the amount of data that's going in is incredible, and they can do incredible things. Running one of them will be the carbon footprint of one of us over our entire life, just once. There's an ecological question about this stuff. I don't know how to solve that, but thank you. Let me just say that I'm sure Juliet would be happy to answer questions um, over our buffet table. So please help yourself and, and um, don't be shy about approaching her. And um, let me thank Juliet for this absolutely marvelous lecture and you know for launching our um, new version of the lectures in um, criticism series. And yes, also thank you all for staying so long. It means a lot that the series can continue at BU. So. I also, I, I'd like to thank Walter Hopp for introducing Julia, and I have to thank Tamsin Flanders, who um, has just taken thank care of every you. little detail to make this lecture work. So thank you all very much, and please help yourself. There's a lot of food and drink.